Professor Gavor, and I'd like to speak to you about Chapter 13, Positive Externalities and Public Goods. We have a separate presentation on public goods for this week, but I will go through this entire chapter. So uh, we're talking about why the private sector underinvests in innovation, perhaps, how governments can encourage innovation, and then cover public goods a little bit. So, you know, the government paid for the space programs in general, from Mercury to uh, Apollo, Gemini Apollo, through the space shuttle, through various satellites that are sent out, uh, missions that uh, explore other planets. And Voyager 1 was launched in 77. It took that many years, from 77 to 2012, um, the first human object to do so that enter interstellar space and expected to send back data and images until 2025. Um, the government paid a lot of money to create the satellite and send it out and we get all this information. And the government provides the information and does the research and pushes the envelope through its investment and there's spillover into the consumer sector as well. Uh, a lot of space research helps create new technologies, new materials, uh, electronic innovations, all kinds of things that lead to many of the things we have in life uh, that, that make our lives easier today from uh, microwaves to cell phones to powdered uh, orange juice, I think Tang, used to be a brand that uh, touted that they were created by NASA. I have, uh, uh, you know, in a lack of gravity, ballpoint pens don't work. So Fisher Space Pen uh, came up with refills that were pressurized and could write at any angle. If you, you know, if you know that you're lying down and on your couch and trying to write uh, kind of horizontal, you know, vertically, where your pen is aimed in the wrong direction, Gravity-wise, it will run out of ink very quickly, but the Fisher pen won't do that, and that was another innovation. A small one, but uh, I have a couple of those, actually. Why the private sector underinvests in innovation? Well, market competition provides a certain incentive for discovering new, you know, doing the R&D, basically. Because a firm will, if they come up with an innovation or a new technology that provides an innovation and people like it, they will have exclusivity in the market for a while and be able to reap the profits from that. And that's why the U.S. you know, and many countries have patent laws, so that if you come up and spend a lot of your own money on a research, on an innovation, for some period of time before the patent runs out, you're able to exclusively sell that item and offer that to the public and then reap a profit beyond your R&D investment. Um, in some cases, though, uh, competition can discourage new technology, especially if the idea is quickly, um, if it's able to be copied. If you think of an innovation that's just, uh, I don't know, putting a new button on something that makes it do act a little bit differently, but it's not really a patentable new technology or new created whatever, um, everybody could copy it. If you come up with an app that does something uh, and everybody loves it, other people can create their own apps and write their own code. And, and mimic the same thing because the idea of is not necessarily patentable even though people try to do that. Um, so studies have shown that the original inventor receives one third to a half of the total economic benefits from the innovations while other businesses and new product users receive the rest. That's often the case. In fact, there's, there's, there's all kinds of studies of the inventor not getting anything in a company that he sold the invention to or that ripped off the invention from him makes most of that. So 
there's a gap. So let's look at two things, private benefits, the, um, the positive externalities of new <coughs> technology. A private benefit is a benefits a person who consumes a good or service receives or a new product benefits or process that a company's invents that the company captures. So if a person consuming a good receives a benefit, that's a private benefit. And if the, uh, or if a new product's benefit or process is something that a company invents and that the company captures and able to keep those, those profits. Social benefits is the value of all the positive externalities of a new idea or product. And remember, positive externality is the benefit a third party receives from the transaction of two other parties. Uh, whether enjoyed by the companies or society as a whole, as well as the private benefits that the firm that developed the new technology receives. So, um, social benefits equals private benefits plus some external benefits. So positive externalities or benefits are the beneficial spillovers to a third party or parties as we talked about before. So let's look at this drug company. It's called Big Drug. Faces the cost of borrowing at 8%. So right here, this is the private borrowing. If the firm receives only private benefits of investing in R&D, then we show its demand curve for financial capital is deprivate. And that's their demand for capital at 8%. And here's the rate of return they get. So at 8% and you're borrowing at 8%, uh, you know, that's kind of an equilibrium point there. And the equilibrium point occurs at $30 million. Because there are spillover benefits, in other words, if the drug company creates a, a cholesterol drug, uh, people will benefit from that. It will force other companies to, like when uh, Pfizer invented Lipitor, the first statin drug to control cholesterol. They had exclusivity in that market for a while. Shortly thereafter, other companies started creating their own statins and getting patents on it. They weren't quite the same formula. And then after the patent period was over, uh, Libertor became a commodity that any drug company could produce, and the prices came down drastically. So by first coming up with a statin drug, Libertor, there was a benefit for Pfizer. But the spillover benefit was the longevity that people get from using these drugs, no matter who makes it, and they cracked the code first, other people came along and tried to copy it and, you know, innovated in a way that they could get their own patent on their own drug that might have been just as effective or almost as effective, maybe more effective. So the work that Pfizer did inspired others to copy them and come up with their own drugs, not necessarily, <coughs> excuse me, steal the Lipitor formula, but to innovate themselves. So the spillover to society has been um, longer, healthier lives for people. Right? We find people dying from heart attacks at younger ages, uh, rarer than it was in the 60s and 70s. So, if the firm could keep all the social benefits itself, its demand curve for financial capital would be de-social. They want to take $52 million, and because that's the size of the entire market, perhaps, and the benefit that society gets. But unless there's a way for the company to fully enjoy the total benefits, it will borrow, borrow less than the socially optimal level. So that's where you know companies invest some in R and D, and then sometimes governments make up the rest through grants and research proposals, and at universities because if governments can invest in that basic research, they know there's a benefit to society.
beyond what the companies will do. And if they provide that basic research, then companies are willing to invest. So if government provides this much, you know, the difference between 30 and 52, and then allows the companies, once they do some basic research, to invest the rest, it seems to be a system that works kind of well. So the investment in education or human capital requires kind of a certain upfront cost with an uncertain future benefit. So this idea that, you know, this a college education, for example, will eventually lead to a person's future productivity and subsequent ability to earn is huge. And I think, you know, it's been proven out that that's the case, that economists have found through several studies that they've done over the years that the rate of return of a college education to that uh, to a person in the U.S. is probably 10 to 15 percent higher. Uh, I think when college was more exclusive, those percentages were probably even higher. So private rates of return. It's the estimated rates of return go primarily to an individual, for example, earning interest on a savings account. As a private rate of return. Society also gains from investing in education another, another, of another student or all students. So the societal rate of return on schooling is also a positive rate. So better health outcomes for the population, lower levels of crime, cleaner environment, a more stable democratic government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm a big supporter myself of public education uh, and was a recipient of such uh, throughout my entire, I went to Detroit public schools and then a suburb of Detroit, Livonia public schools to finish high school and uh, went to the University of Michigan and Wayne State University where I got all my education there. And I, I, I couldn't have think, thought of a better way for my tax dollars to be, uh, to, to be at work. We've, in the United States, um, the support of public university education has gone down dramatically so that uh, many of the public universities, like my alma mater, University of Michigan, is almost a private university. It's still state university, but the, the tuitions are close to being private level for in-state students as well as out-of-state students. And the number, the amount of money given to it by the state has decreased over time. I think that's actually in the wrong direction. Subject for another lecture, of course. All right, so what's the appropriate public policy uh, for a positive externality, like a new technology uh, or help, you know, and, and, and the policy is to help create that positive externality and uh, receive a greater share of the social benefits. You want to be able to share that. So if you look at three things, uh, four things here, MPC is marginal private costs and marginal private benefits, marginal social benefits, marginal social costs. And the reason I put the, um, this in a question mark, we only consider the top three. I don't think this is even measurable. So if we go here and we look at this, here's the market demand for something. Here's the social demand for something. And here's, um, so this is the quantity of flu vaccines. This is the price per vaccine. And we know there's flu vaccines all over the place and they're essentially free. I mean, it's a very, very low cost. Insurance companies don't charge much. I don't think the drug companies make much. Maybe the government subsidized lots of this uh, in this pandemic time that I'm giving this lecture. This probably even makes more sense. So if we have the, the normal market, if we just let it be a private, you know, marginal private benefits, and that's the demand curve here. And we have the marginal private costs, which is the supply curve, what people are willing to uh, 
provide quantities of flu shots at what price. So you have a market price for it right here. It's a quantity and a price. Now, if you want to achieve a social benefit and have it more widely used, you've got to have a demand curve that's a marginal social benefit. You'd like to be here. And, but if, if you increase it that much, what you end up with is the quantity, the social quantity provided. Not everybody's going to take a flu shot or flu vaccine. And the price, the social price of it. Now, the government wants to make it even more advantageous to people because right here at this, at this price, if you leave it, you know, if that's where the social benefit is, you'd like to have this quantity, what's going to happen is most people will, if we don't change the demand curve, will consume at a much lesser amount than the social amount you, you wanted. And in fact, it's less than the, the market equilibrium if you just left things alone. So the government then provides a subsidy for this investment to bring the price down to here and create the demand at a higher level. So really, they've created a marginal social cost kind of supply chain right here to get this equilibrium point and then that's why things are so much less now what does the government get for their subsidy well they get a healthier population they get more productivity uh, people don't get so sick from the flu that's why this pandemic thing is absolutely unprecedented uh, in the loss of productivity and, you know, right now we have our able politicians, and I say that sometimes with a wink and nod, suggesting that maybe the cure is more costly than if we just let things go to the economy. So you have this debate now of what price human life, blah, blah, blah. Uh, do we restart? Do we not restart? Who's at risk? And there are so many unknowns going into it that uh, it's hard to tell until some later date when we can look back at it. Remember, hindsight is twenty twenty, and see if the decisions we made were actually the right ones. So how can governments encourage innovation? So there's different government policies for this. They guarantee intellectual property rights. This is like the patent system. If I write a book, it's copyrighted. If I create a new formula or you create a new formula for a drug, you can patent it. If you create a new design for an electric motor that's um, innovative and so different that it, you know, it's, it takes less electricity and um, has a higher output, well, that's patentable and you, your intellectual property is, is guaranteed. This has fallen apart in the digital age a little bit in the terms of music, because music is so copyable. Send me an MP3 of it, send me an MP4 of that, um, of that song. I mean, it's so shareable. They've tried to make the prices low. You can go and you pay a, a small subscription and have access to basically all the music there is on uh, some of the streaming services to the point where musicians don't make money on their song recordings anymore. They make, they make their money on the concert tours. Government assistance with the cost of research and R&D. Uh, public university, private universities getting government grants uh, to do certain research. So cooperative research inventions between universities and companies, that's becoming more and more popular. Um, and in fact, states like, and I'll go back to where I know something about it, there's three research universities in the state of Michigan, the University of Michigan, Michigan State University, and Wayne State University in Detroit. And they're um, all looking at a research consortium. Uh, the University of North Carolina and Duke 
and I think North Carolina State have a research triangle in the Carolinas. Um, Chicago is well poised to do that with U of I, University of Illinois, um, University of Chicago, and Northwestern University, three, um, two top 10 universities and uh, one top 25, probably top 30 university with the University of Illinois. There's a lot of power in university corporate cooperation. I don't think Chicago's taken advantage of it as perhaps to the degree that they have in North Carolina or um, a mission. So intellectual property rights. So this is a body of laws that's patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secret laws that protect the right of the inventor. Patents give the inventor exclusive right to make or use or sell. We've talked about this before for a limited amount of time. So you've put in a lot of money, you've invested a lot of money and time in coming up with a innovative uh, electric motor design or a new pharmaceutical. Uh, other people can then turn around and just look, buy your product, reverse engineer it and create one of their own. Uh, so if they were able to do that with, with no penalty, there would be no incentive for them to invest the time and research the time and money into the research to develop those things. So the government gives them, okay, you have a patent, you've applied for it, we've approved it, you have exclusivity over this for X amount of time, like 10 years, let's say. And then after that, so if you're, if it's a hit, you will reap your R&D plus get an economic profit out of it. Copyright laws give the author exclusive legal right over works of literature, music, film, pictures. I have a friend that uh, wrote a song. I love it. I perform it. Um, and I asked him, I said, I mean, obviously if I perform it, I'm going to give you credit for it, especially if it's a concert where it's going to be in a program. But do I have to pay you anything? And he, he knew the answer to that. Uh, he says, you don't have to pay me anything to perform it. That's free. But if I recorded it and sold the recording, well, then it would be, um, I would owe him a royalty for using his song. So if we look at the amount of patents, patent applications that are filed and the number of patent applications that are granted, look at the increase in the number of patents. It was, you know, it's, it's, it, I would say if I fit a regression line to that, it would probably have a, a slope that looks like this. Even though I'm not sure what happened in 2013, I don't know if this was an anomaly or maybe innovation has died a little bit going forward. But the number of applications has increased substantially. Now, part, uh, due in part to the invention of the Internet, which has led to many other inventions and to the 1998 uh, Copyright Term Extension Act. But the number of patents granted has a much lower slope. And probably, I'm not sure what happened here, I probably should look into it, but I, I think maybe they might have revised the law of what's patentable and what's not patentable, which reduced the number of patents uh, applications and therefore the number of patents granted. Uh, but the government, we could go there and look and probably get an update for this. Government spending on research and development. Well, if the private sector does not have sufficient incentive to carry out the R&D, the government could provide a subsidy or fund the work directly. And where do they go through? Colleges and universities, nonprofit research entities, uh, sometimes private firms, and sometimes government-run laboratories. The government has, you know, the Argonne National Laboratories are actually in Illinois, and they do a lot of nuclear research. So you have government-funded laboratories. You have, uh, you know, that laboratory in China was government-funded where they, uh, there's some speculation that the virus might have escaped, the COVID-19 virus might have escaped from there. I still go with the wet market theory, but 
government-run laboratories is another place to do it. Uh, tax breaks for research and development. Another approach, or complementary approach, as they say here, is to give, uh, you know, if you invest in R&D, you can reduce your taxes depending on how much research and development you do. So the federal government refers to this policy as research and experimentation tax credit. Uh, there's been, of course, studies that find that uh, each dollar of foregone tax revenue through R&E tax credit causes firms to invest at least a dollar or more in R&D. So if you're investing heavily in R&D, you're pouring your profits back into your company, basically, you get a tax break for that. Even though your income was, uh, uh, your profit was a certain amount, by pouring it back into R&D, the government's saying we're willing to uh, tax you at a lower rate or reduce your taxes to ins provide that incentive for you to do that. Cooperative research. Uh, so state and federal governments uh, look at a variety of ways of partnerships and grants for innovative projects. One example might be the National Institute of Health or National Academy of Scientists and Agricultural and Food Research Initiative where people are looking at a variety of different things and cooperation between government-funded universities, academies, and private sectors. You can spur and create whole new industries by doing this. I mean, Silicon Valley, right around Stanford and Berkeley, is probably the premier example of that kind of relationship. And then you end up, and I think what when I talked about the Research Triangle in the Carolinas and the initiative in Michigan, which is probably way down the list if, if Silicon Valley is the top, you start attracting people and creating that buzz and increasing that productivity by creating a community around startup companies and um, universities. So even though there's another uh, presentation on public goods, let's talk about it a little bit. So public good is something that's non-excludable and non-rival. What? Those are new terms. Well, excludable and non-excludable. Uh, it is costly or impossible to exclude someone from using a good and thus hard to charge for it. So that would be non-excludable. It would be excludable if the only way you could use it is to charge for it. Now, let's look at something like, you know, the example everybody uses is air. Uh, you can't charge for air. It's a non-excludable good. I mean, the Chicago, city of Chicago, as I joked in the other video, would love to tax it if they could. But they haven't figured out a way. A breath tax. An excludable good would be like a car. You can't just drive a car for free. You've got to buy the car, lease the car, rent the car temporarily from a rental agency, or per usage, like a taxi cab or Uber. Those are excludable goods. So a public good has to be non-excludable, impossible to charge someone. Is the internet excludable or non-excludable? Well, it's pretty much free everywhere you kind of go with free Wi-Fi and this, that, the other thing, I don't even know what I pay a month for my home Wi-Fi, but I know that in the large scheme and the usage I get from it, it's essentially close to being a free, so it's kind of non-excludable. Uh, a non-rival good is an arrival good. So what are those? E even when a person uses the public good, another can also use it. Um, a non-rival good. Uh, so. Given the initial investment for the internet, for example, to add someone else to the internet, to, to give grant them internet access once you've created this whole internet infrastructure, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, the example I use for rival and non-rival is a public and national defense. Once you've invested this huge amount of money in a national defense, uh, everybody that's born is automatically covered by it, so it's a non-rival good. So fire and police services go the same way, no matter how many people you have in your city. Obviously, if you 
multiply the number of people you have in your city by 10, you probably have to invest more in police. But if we're talking about small numbers of increase, it's a non-rival good. So public goods are non-excludable and non-rival. Uh, the highway systems is what we use in the other uh, presentation to explain what a, a public good is. The other thing is what you call a free rider. And um, a free rider is basically, I think the term comes from some, you know, when cities first created trolley and bus systems and light rail systems, uh, subways and L trains, uh, the free rider would be someone that didn't pay for the ride. Jump the turnstile, kind of snuck on the bus, that kind of thing. They're a free rider. They're taking advantage of everybody else's uh, benefit. I mean, right now, even, uh, I don't know what a Chicago bus costs, was it $2.50? But you can ride all day, I think, with transfers, et cetera. Um, certainly in a subway, you can do that. If you don't leave the subway system, you can drive, you can take the New York City subway system anywhere it goes for a very small amount of money. So it's essentially a public good, even though the charges are to help pay for uh, that service but it doesn't it's it's not the only there's also government subsidies that pay for it. so if too many people are free riders the government the, the public good may never be provided so the free rider problem can be expressed in similar terms as a prisoner's dilemma game which we talked about before so the role of government in paying for public goods uh, the key to paying for a public good is to assure that everyone will make a contribution and prevent free riders. This is done through government spending and taxes. So we use these, our tax dollars, you know, when I, when I feel like my tax dollars are well, well used, I feel proud and happy to pay a tax. If people avoid paying taxes, uh, they end up with uh, less services. And you end up with a country where, you know, 30% of the people are free riders. Uh, it's not going to work very well. In some cases, the markets can produce public goods and creates an indirect way of charging for it. Example, uh, public radio, even though no one actually listens to the radio radio anymore. I think it's almost exclusively Internet based at this point. Uh, but, I mean, I get in my car and I listen to NPR. <laughs> It's a public good, but the revenue is made by advertising and charging listeners by taking up some of their time. Uh, even NPR, which is a public good and my primary source of news when I'm actually not home isolated, um, is wonderful. And uh, I've contributed to it every once in a while, and they have those pledge periods and all that. So, you know, there's, it's not necessarily free but it's a government subsidized or private sector subsidized methodology. Um, good that's provided, that's, the cost is a fraction of the benefit that people get from it. So social pressures and personal appeals can also reduce the number of free riders and to collect resources for the public good. If you think of a subway, well, if you don't have a card, you can't get on the subway. And I see more people jumping turnstiles in movies uh, than I ever saw people jumping turnstiles um, when I lived in New York City and occasionally took the subway. So if we get people to realize that it's a collective, like the tragedy of the commons kind of thing, where everybody has some social responsibility, to pay the modicum amount of money for these public goods, then it, it will work and people can do more with it. So positive externalities in public health programs. So if we talk about public health, there have been linked uh, positive externalities in public goods. So the rise in life expectancy seems to be from three primary factors. Public sanitation systems providing clean water and disposing of human waste to help prevent the transmission of disease. Medical discoveries from government and university funded research such as immunizations, antibiotics, high blood pressure reducers. 
uh, changes in public behavior through government health campaigns. <laughs> Hand washing. Oh boy, does that strike a chord right now. Uh, food and storage protection. I mean, you know, we've got the invention of refrigeration has been a huge thing. Reducing tobacco smokers. I mean, how have we done that? It's happened gradually over time, and it was done with increased taxes. It was done with um, public uh, public advertisements and a, a constant messaging about the dangers of smoking. And lastly, most municipalities banning smoking in public places and precautions against sexually transmitted diseases. I guess that's worked out well. It's following the tobacco uh, method of public advertising and some laws, even though it's harder to find out when people are doing things. They, it's a private thing, so it's not done in public generally. I will back out of this before I say something really idiotic. Um, the use of seatbelts in cars saves lives. The use of safety legislation into automobiles has saved lives. Uh, if you think about it, the um, steering wheel shaft, the shaft that you, your steering wheel sits on, used to be a rigid piece of steel. If you get in an accident and weren't wearing a seatbelt, it basically crushed your ribcage, kills you. Now, they've put legislation in place and forced innovation and invested in innovation for a collapsible steering column. So that if you get in an accident and there's enough force uh, of your body, it makes the steering wheel collapse. Under normal conditions, it's almost impossible to make it collapse. But in an accident, it will collapse and, and, and it breaks before your ribs break, which is a good thing. You might end up with a big bruise, but a big bruise is better than breaking all your ribs. Uh, people that didn't wear seatbelts used to go flying out the windshield. Windshields were made of glass. Glass, generally, when it breaks, turns into shards, and people were all cut up and died from that. Now, if you look at the safety glasses in automobiles, which is the result of government um, research, government subsidized research and industry research and university research all at the same time, if you take a hammer and break your windshield, it breaks into little, like, cube, little small pebbles with no sharp edges. They've designed the glass in a way to do that so that if you, for some reason, get thrown out the windshield, it won't cut you all up. So there's government legislation, and you know the automotive industry went kicking and screaming into some of these, but they all end up being good things and have helped uh, reduce the amount of traffic fatalities, even though the number of uh, <coughs> cars on a road has grown almost exponentially. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon.